and welcome to the fifth of our webinars about the basics of photography and getting off auto. I'm Angela Nicholson and I'm the founder of She Clicks. Today, today I'm going to bring together everything we've spoken about previously to help you take control of your camera and take the images that you want. But before we really get started, I'd like to say a word from our sponsor, which is Fujifilm. Now, Fujifilm has a system which enables you to try a camera or lens for up to 48 hours completely free, and that includes the delivery cost as well. So if there's a, a Fujifilm camera or a Fujifilm lens that you fancy trying, then have a look at fujifilm-loan.com and see if you can arrange a date that you can give it a go for two days. Um, perhaps you own a Fujifilm camera and there's a lens that you'd really like to try or you've got an event coming up and you think there's a specific lens that would work really, really well, then um, have a look and give it a go because it's completely free. Um, maybe it's just a special event, you wanna try it, give it a go. Um, also, if you want to have a longer loan, you can extend it, that will be a paid loan. But if you decide subsequently to buy the camera or the lens, then you get that fee deducted from the price. So that's good news. So also thank you very much to Fujifilm for sponsoring this webinar. So let's start with a quick recap. And actually most of this webinar is gonna seem like a recap because we've covered everything. We're just pulling it all together and helping sort of underline some of the key points. So exposure, it's the amount of light that's required to make an image. Now, sometimes we think about exposure as being the brightness of an image um, or the darkness of it, how, how it looks. But really in this context, we're talking about how much light is required to make an image. And um, usually we're sort of talking about correct exposure. So it looks like a, an image that you're happy with. Exposure is controlled by the amount of time that the shutter is open, also known as shutter speed, and the size of the aperture that the light passes through, as well as the sensitivity of the film or sensor, which is also known as ISO. So what is ISO? Well, we covered that in the last webinar, but you may remember that photographic film has a speed rating that indicates how much light it needs to form an image. And this standard or this, sorry, this speed is defined by the International Standards Organization, which gets shortened to ISO. So when we're talking about an ISO 100 film, um, we know that all ISO 100 films require the same amount of light, the same exposure, to create an image. And that's really useful because it means, you know, if you swap from one ISO 100 film to another, then if the lighting stays the same, you can use the same exposure settings. Similarly, if you swap to an ISO 200 film, you know, it will take uh, less exposure than an ISO 100 film and all other ISO 200 films will be the same as it. Now, obviously with a digital camera, you can't change the sensor to, uh, you know, to uh, make it more or less sensitive. But what you can do is apply more gain to the image signal. And that is how digital cameras replicate or mimic the effect of different ISO or different uh, film ratings. And we call these settings ISOs. So let's look at the numbers. And you may remember this graphic from before. So we've got a, a low setting on the left. So ISO 200, sorry, ISO 100, and it may go lower. Your camera may go down to ISO 32 or 64 or 50 or something like that. But those are the low settings. And then on the other end, you've got the high settings and your camera may top out at 51,200, but it may go higher. So. The low settings, um, we've got a little tortoise there because we generally think about them being, we call that, we used to call that slow film, but it's because you needed longer exposures with it. And um, they enable you to capture really nice, sharp, crisp images. But if you can't get the sense, sorry, if you can't get the aperture and shutter speed settings that you want, you need to use a faster setting. And that is why we have the higher ISO settings. Now, um, the higher ISO settings are useful when there's less light because the camera is more sensitive. So it doesn't need as much light to record an image. So you would use a high setting, maybe indoors if there's not much light or outdoors at night uh, when you use, you know, there's no, there's no, not enough light. Now, if you look at the numbers, you'll notice that they go up in uh, multiples of two. So we go from 100, 200, 400, 800. Nice, simple multiplication. And what it means is that if you move from a 100 to a 200 speed, the sensor is effectively twice as sensitive. So it only needs half as much light 
to form an image. And if you go from 200 to 400, again, you're increasing the amount of the sensitivity of the sensor by a factor of two, and you only need half as much light. And if you go the other way, it's halving. So we're talking about halving and doubling of sensitivity and halving and doubling of the amount of light that's required to form an image. So that's nice and sort of relatively straightforward, although initially the numbers might seem a strange, it, quite strange, it's, it's a quite a convenient structure. And those um, 100, 200, 400s, those are what we call, um, that's moving in whole stops or whole exposure values. And there are settings in between, but um, we just tend to sort of just remember the 100, 200, those sort of the main numbers, as, as, so to speak. So now let's move on to shutter speed. It's shutter speed is also known as exposure time. And it's the amount of time that the shutter is open to let light reach the sensor or film. The longer the shutter is open, the greater the amount of light that can reach the sensor. And that's quite a logical thing. You know, if you open your curtains for longer, then you let more light through than if you just open and shut them really quickly. Uh, shutter speed is measured in seconds, usually fractions of a second, but sometimes in whole seconds and sometimes it can be minutes. So let's take a look at the shutter speed settings and these should seem fairly familiar. So we're talking about, and so you can start with whole seconds and then we go to fractions of a second. So if we start with one second, the next um, shutter speed setting, which reduces it by half is a half second. So that's a nice straightforward fraction that we can understand. Reducing it again by a half takes it to a quarter. And then we go to an eighth um, and then a 15th. Now, Logically, you think it should be a 16th, but it actually makes relatively little difference. And I'm not 100% sure why we go for 15th uh, and uh, sort of rather than a 16th, but I think it's just to do with kind of keeping the maths a little bit more straightforward. And as I say, by the time you're chopping it up this much, it doesn't make as much difference. So again, we're talking about um, if you go for, uh, we're talking about doubling and halving. So if you go from a 60th of a second to a 30th of a second, you are doubling the amount of light which is reaching the sensor. So you are increasing the exposure, you are making the image brighter. Now aperture. So aperture is the hole in the lens through which the light passes to reach the sensor or the film. The bigger the hole, the greater the amount of light that can reach the sensor. And again, that's perfectly logical. You've got a bigger hole, more light goes through it. But let's look at the aperture settings and you remember that they are a little bit on the odd side and that's because we're talking about a fraction and essentially a ratio that enables you to compare apertures between different lenses so you could have a 200 mil lens and a 50 mil lens and if you set them to f8 the same amount of light gets through so it, it can't be helped really that it's this kind of a, a rule of physics that the numbers are going to be a bit strange and when we have the f that stands for the focal length in millimeters and it's divided by the diameter of the lens so sorry diameter of the aperture so we do have these rather weird numbers but it's still when you move from f1 to f1.4 to f2 you are moving in whole stops and you are halving the amount of light as you go from a large aperture to a small aperture if you move in whole stops you halve the amount of light each time but just sort of looking at it cold mathematically, it doesn't really make a great deal of, s sort of uh, sense just sort of staring at it for the first time. But when you understand that there's a fraction involved, it becomes a little bit more sensible. So while the numbers are odd, um, the theme is the same as it was with shutter speed and ISO. We're talking about halving and doubling. So it makes sense if you have got, say, um, an f 2.8 lens, it lets, uh, sorry, an aperture set to that, then it's going to let lots of light in. But if you close the aperture down to, say, f 16 or f 22, you are letting a lot less light through. So I find it helpful to think about exposure as filling a bucket with water from a hose pipe. So if you imagine a, a bucket is a finite size, it's a fixed size that takes a certain amount of water and a sensor or a film at a specific ISO setting requires a set amount of light to create an image. So if you're going to fill your bucket, if you have a narrow bore hose pipe, you're going to have to turn the tap on and leave it running for quite some time before you will fill that bucket. So if you think of the shutter speed as being the length of time that the tap is open, 
running the water, then you kind of can understand the connection. So small bore pipe, long, um, long tap, running tap. So you have a small aperture and a long exposure. Conversely, if you have a huge pipe uh, with a big bore, then you only need to turn the tap on for a short length of time to fill that bucket. So you can see that if you have um, a large aperture, it doesn't need quite such a long exposure to get the right amount of light onto the sensor to create your image. So at any ISO setting, the sensor requires a specific amount of light for a correct exposure. And at a fixed ISO, if the aperture is made smaller, the shutter speed needs to be reduced so that the exposure is longer. So you have a balance. And conversely, if the aperture is made bigger, the shutter speed must be increased so the exposure is shorter. Again, because you've got to balance out making the larger, um, making the large, sorry, making the aperture larger, you have to have less exposure. So you've got a bigger hose pipe, you need to turn the tap off quicker. Also, it's worth bearing in mind that you can have different set, uh, sensitive, sorry, you can have different shutter speed and aperture combinations, which give you effectively the same amount of light. The effect might be slightly different, but you have the same amount of light. So for example, a 60th of a second at F8 gives you the same exposure as 120th of a second at F5.6. And that is because 120th of a second is twice the speed of 60th of a second and f5.6 lets twice as much light through as f8 so you've got effectively the same amount of light going through now you might have seen this exposure triangle or different variations of it um, before and basically the point is it's trying to explain the balance that you need to strike between aperture shutter speed and sensitivity or iso now i put iso at the bottom because i feel that's kind of like the basis and if you were working with film then you know you you have one iso setting for 36 exposures so that's what you work with so on the left you have aperture and it's just the same scale as we saw before we've got a large aperture at the bottom so that's like f1 f1.4 f2 that kind of thing and then we've got small apertures at the top but to be honest i think this kind of makes it a bit more complicated than it needs to be i prefer to think of exposure as a balance and at any given sensitivity, you need to have a balance between the shutter speed and the aperture. And it's up to you to decide what, sensor, sorry, what shutter speed and what aperture you want. And if you can't get those settings, then you need to adjust the ISO. So the creative controls are the shutter speed and the aperture, whereas the ISO is the thing that enables them to happen. Now, generally, we have a trend. We try and keep the sensitivity low if we can. We want to keep the ISO reasonably low because that will give you the cleanest, most detailed image. But if you're shooting at night and, um, you know, you're shooting the night sky or something like that, there's a limit to how long you can make the exposure uh, without the stars going into streaks. Um, and there's, you know, there's a finite size to the max, the aperture of your lens. So you need to start thinking about pushing the ISO up. And actually, as we discussed previously, cameras these days do produce much cleaner images at quite high sensitivity settings, much better than they used to, and certainly better than film used to be. So when we're talking about uh, finding the correct exposure, this is the sort of scale that we tend to be looking at, or this is the sort of scene where we're looking at. You would see this on the back of the camera, but you'd see something similar in the viewfinder as well. So on the left of the image, you can see a scale. And at the zero point, we have the arrow pointing to us. And that, that is indicating that this uh, the camera considers this scene is going to be correctly exposed. Now it's the camera is set to manual exposure mode and you can see that by the M at the bottom there. And it's also set to ISO 1600. That was just the setting that was selected. Um, and I've set uh, a shutter speed of 125th. It, there's too much, um, it, it takes up too much space to do a one over 125. So it tends to be uh, shortened like this. So it's 125th of a second and an F8. Now I could adjust the sensitivity up, sorry, I could uh, and down, or I could adjust the shutter speed and the aperture up and down to have a different combination of settings if I want. But these ones just happen to work. 
the indicator, the exposure indicator will show the arrow move up. Say if I switch from 125th to a 60th, that's a one stop change. It will show the arrow moving up to plus one. So the camera thinks that the image is going to be overexposed, but I'm in control. I'm the one who's determining how I want the image to look. So how do we select the correct exposure settings? Well, there are several things you need to think about. And one of the first things is how much depth of field do you want? That is a key consideration and that determines how, uh, what aperture setting you set. Is there any movement uh, that you want to freeze or blur in your image? And when you're thinking about movement, there are two types of movement you really need to think about. One is the subject moving and the other is the camera moving. Now, if, you're, um, you know, if your subject is moving, you have the decision of whether you want to freeze it or blur it. Generally, um, if your shutter speed is getting low so you can't handhold the camera steady enough, you need to put it on a tripod and then you can use the shutter speed that you want. Unless you're doing something like intentional camera movement, you want an exposure that lets you record the movement. If you set a fast shutter speed and a small aperture, you may need a high ISO setting. And that does depend on the, the amount of light that's available. Um, in the Northern Hemisphere at the moment, we're getting towards uh, you know, summer, it's, it, we're getting towards the longest day. So there's a lot of light around on a sunny day. And you can use quite small, um, so you can use quite small apertures and quite fast shutter speeds at low ISO and everything's hunky-dory. But as it moves towards winter or you go into woodland that's overcast um, and shaded, then you may need to, uh, to move this sensitivity up. And if you set a slow shutter speed and a large aperture, you may need to use a low ISO. So say if you wanted to blur water, the movement of water, say you're at this, the coast and you want to have milky uh, white water, then you need a really slow shutter speed to do that. And you have to have a slow ISO. And one way to get that low ISO is to use um, so it would be to normally to use a narrow aperture. But of course, if you want to restrict the depth of field for some reason, then you're going to have to use a particularly low ISO. And in fact, you may want to use a filter to cut the light out even more. Now, a quick reminder of depth of field. It's the zone of acceptable sharpness that extends in front of and behind the point of focus. So you may remember this graphic and it's just to indicate that if you use a large aperture such as f2.8, you get very shallow depth of field. So if you can imagine focusing on that first tree, the depth of field, the zone of sharpness extends a little bit in front of and a little bit of behind. But the trees further beyond the, the focus point, they are going to be blurred. And the further away you go from the focus point, the more blurred they're going to be. And any sort of little bits of grass in the foreground, they will be blurred as well. If you close to a more moderate um, aperture, such as f8, then you'll get more depth of field. And if you look, if we keep the uh, if we keep the focus point at the same point, the depth of field extends a little bit further behind the point of focus than it does in front. It still creeps forward, but you get more behind the point of focus than uh, in front. And similarly, closing down to f22, you get much more extensive depth of field and you can, you, you know, you might be lucky and be able to focus, so get the whole scene in focus and it will be a little bit in front and quite a long way behind. So when you're thinking about where you want to focus, that's a key to, thing to remember. But this, so ap because aperture controls depth of field as well as overall exposure, it's a key part of your decision, thinking about how much of my image do I want to be in focus. Now, moving on to shutter speed, you can see here I've got a moving subject and I've photographed him at a 30th of a second. And because he's moving quite fast, it's pretty blurred. Now, if you look, the grass, um, just sort of where his front paw is, is actually pretty sharp. So it's not the camera shake that's the problem. It's the, it's the dog's movement. Shifting all the way up to a thousandth of a second, he's really nicely frozen. And you can see that the, the um, depth of field is actually quite shallow in this image. His, his nose and his eyes and his front paws are all pretty sharp. But if you look towards his back legs, they're getting a little bit soft and you can see the grass behind is blurred. So he's nicely isolated from it. But, but because I've used a very fast shutter speed, we have, I have had to use quite a big aperture. And I, in this instance, I'm perfectly happy with that. Uh, now, so this is a, um, an example where you can be a bit more creative 
with shutter speeds. So here, rather than using a shutter speed of a thousandth of a second to freeze the movement, I've used a relatively slow shutter speed, which has enabled me to record a little bit of blur. But what I've done, I've panned the camera with Otto's movement and I've managed to keep his face sharp. Um, and it's been, the shutter speeds have been fast enough to freeze his face's movement, but because his legs are moving so fast, they are blurred. And because I'm panning the camera, the background has got this kind of nice blur as well. So you get this sort of streaks and sense of movement. So this is what I'm saying is it's about deciding how much blur you want in your image when you're thinking about shutter speed. Now it can be very handy, both at the outset when you're learning about using shutter speed and aperture, um, but also when you're, you know, when you're a very experienced photographer, it can be handy to use the auto ISO setting because this enables you to just focus on the creative element of your exposure. So you're just thinking about aperture and depth of field and shutter speed, whether you want frozen movement or blurred movement. And it's a kind of cop out auto setting because what's happening is say you're controlling the look of the image but the camera is controlling the exposure through the iso setting so if you're out in um you know outside photographing and you've got um using whatever settings you as and the sun is out but then the sun goes in the exposure won't change because the camera will adjust the iso accordingly so it's a really handy option to use. But what you need to do when you're using it is to keep an eye on the, the ISO settings that are being used. Now you can often restrict them, so it'll only go within a certain range. But say if you walked into a woodland and it was really dense canopy and the sun went in and you'd been shooting with a very narrow aperture and using quite a fast shutter speed, you'll suddenly find that the camera is using a really high ISO and you'll start to get a bit of a noisy image and you might want to rethink that. You know, you might realize actually, you know what, I don't need this small aperture. I don't need such a, um, a short uh, exposure time. So you just need to keep an eye on it. Also, if you're shooting uh, using auto ISO, you can use that as kind of like basis to get started with your manual settings. So you, sh you shoot a few images using whatever aperture and shutter speed that you want and check what ISO it is using. And you sort of think, okay, uh, what I'm going to do now, say it's, rec it's using ISO 800, you could decide to set the camera to that. Or you could decide, well, actually, it's making the image a little bit uh, too bright. So you set it to ISO 400. The camera will say, oh, ah, you're going to underexpose, but it's you that's taking control. Okay, so let's look at some typical exposures and then kind of talk about general situations rather than specific numbers. So with landscapes, typically, but not all the time, you want to use a small aperture because you want to have lots of depth of field. You want generally to have the foreground, the midground, and the background to be sharp. And using a small aperture means you're probably going to have to use a low shutter speed or a slow shutter speed. And that's generally fine because landscapes don't move about. Um, if you have got, say, if you're on the edge of a field of barley and it's all whipping about, you've got a decision to make. Do you want to freeze it or do you want it to be blurred? Now, if you want to freeze it, you're going to have to use a faster shutter speed as well, in which case you can handhold the, the camera. But if you're going to use a nice slow shutter speed and get kind of like a dreamy effect, then put the camera on a tripod. Even if you're shooting with a handholdable shutter speed, it's worth thinking about with landscapes in particular, using a tripod because it slows you down and makes you think about your composition a bit more. But generally speaking, with landscapes, we're talking about small apertures, slow shutter speeds and low ISO settings. With sport, there's movement and generally, but not all the time, we want it to be frozen. So you're going to use a fast shutter speed and that often means that you're going to use a larger aperture. Now, the thing about shutter speed is I showed you the shot of Otto where his head's sharp and his legs are all blurred. If you're photographing something like, I haven't done it for a long time, but I used to photograph hockey and I could use a shutter speed of say, I think even something as fast as 500th of a second, the players themselves would be nice and sharp, but the tips of their hockey sticks and the balls were blurred. And it was really nice because it gave you a sense of movement rather than always being completely frozen. So it's a question of balance. There might be times when you want to set a thousandth or a two thousandth of a second to get everything sharp. And there are other times when you think, I'm just going to knock it back a little bit and I'm just going to get a little bit of blur. But generally, say sport, 
usually fast shutter speeds and large apertures. Typically, you know, a lot of sport is shot in the winter in poor lighting conditions. So that often means that high sensitivity settings are used to enable those fast shutter speeds because it's better to have a sharp image with a bit of noise than a blurred image that you didn't intentionally or you didn't intend to be blurred, um, which uh, is either, well, it just, you know, it's too noise, it's too um, dark, it just doesn't look right. Uh, portraits, generally we're talking about large apertures because we want the background to be blurred and that means that we're probably going to be using a fast shutter speed and that's nice because it means you can hand hold the camera, um, you can move about, you can, you can experiment with different angles and everything. Macro, we usually want a small aperture because we want lots of depth of field um, as a rule, and that tends to mean slow shutter speeds. And often we're talking about using a tripod and it's, it's, it's not just because of the shutter speed, it's also because a little bit of movement in macro can make a big difference to the composition and the focus of your image. Street photography is one of the examples where you might want to use a moderate aperture and a moderate shutter speed. So something maybe, you know, say if you're going out and you're just going to be prepared for everything, um, you could set an aperture of f8 and a shutter speed of 125th. And depending on what the light conditions are like, um, you know, you could either set the ISO as you want or you could set it to auto and then you're kind of like you're golden you can go wherever you want and shoot knowing that you've got an aperture which is going to give you enable you to be a little bit forgiving with your focusing um, so if you don't nail exactly the right point there's enough depth of field but it's not such a small aperture that you need to use um, a long exposure and you can handhold the camera and 125th something like that you can freeze somebody walking so you've got you know you've got quite a bit of scope there and you might get you, things that are moving faster you get a bit of blur which can work really well with street photography okay so uh heather has asked me what's the best aperture and shutter speed for sunsets well it's just a question of setting up your camera. I would recommend using a tripod, but setting up your camera and you probably want with a, a sunset, say if you're not just recording the sky, you want a little bit of um, foreground interest, maybe some um, the light hitting the foreground. So you probably want quite a small aperture so you've got lots of depth of field. Then it's just the question of adjusting the shutter speed until the camera or you think that you've got the correct exposure generally it's worth underexposing the um the image a little bit because that will darken the colors in the sky but i can't say to you oh set it to i don't know f16 at um 125th um because i just don't know off the top of my head but that is the, the way to approach it think about analyze the scene you want lots of depth of field so you might go for f16 or f22 but f16 is a better choice generally than f22 because you get the if impact of diffraction can make your image a little bit softer as the image as the aperture gets very small so set the aperture and then adjust the shutter speed according accordingly and generally um you know, if, if the sun is in the frame, then the camera is likely to underexpose the scene quite a bit. It'll say that it's doing correctly, but you might think it looks a bit dark. But have a look, because that will make the sky look great. If you're looking to shoot a silhouette, it's probably going to be fine. But if you want a bit of foreground interest, then you may need to brighten things up a little bit. So someone said, presumably, if you have a slow shutter speed with macro, you need a tripod. Yes, definitely. Um, Generally, with macro photography, it's a good idea to have a tripod anyway, because um, if you think, you know, you're focusing and your depth of field is really, really narrow with macro photography and any slight movements can really change both the composition and the point of focus, as well as blur the shot. Um, so generally, a, a tripod is a good idea. And because you're starting to use very slow shutter speeds, yes, um, put the camera on a tripod. So best long exposure to get car or water movement. Um, OK, so she's new to this and everything just comes out white. So that sounds like you're using too long um, an exposure. So it really depends on um, how fast the water is moving. Now, you might be OK with something like, uh, say, if it's a, a 
a waterfall, a fifteenth of a second might be fine. You might want to take it to uh, an eighth or a quarter of a second. If you go to a whole second, uh, you, it does depend on the lighting conditions, though. Uh, you might find that the the white, the faster bits of moving wet water where it's really tumbling, just end up sort of looking all the same. So rather than getting a streak, you just get a white area. Um, and yeah, so with that point really that's the shutter speed that's the most important thing so what you could do you could set it to manual or you could set it to shutter priority and just try because in shutter priority mode you set the shutter speed and the camera controls the aperture so there's only one thing that you need to worry about um, and if you set the iso to auto then you're only say you're only worrying about shutter speed but um i would start with a low iso setting like something like 100 Try a fifteenth of a second, maybe set the aperture to whatever you, whatever it needs to be to, to get that um, that shutter speed. But generally, it does depend on the depth that you're photographing. So you might want a small you might want a small aperture to get lots of depth of field. So someone has asked um, in panning shots, how do I get the subject clear? Well, the first thing you've got to do is get the focus on the subject and follow them, it, follow it in the frame. So you get them sharp and then you move the camera so that that focus point stays on them and set it to continue autofocus because it's so if there's any change in the distance between you and the subject, the camera will adjust. And then it's about finding the right balance with the shutter speed. So. Um, with a car, for example, I've shot a 15th of a second, but you might need to start with a 60th or something like that. People who are really, really good at panning can shoot at quite uh, very low shutter speeds because they are really good at predicting what speed they need to move the camera. But it, you know, it, it depends on the subject. Um, it depends on your experience. But start with a 15th or a 30th of a second, something like that. But the, the art of panning is to keep the subject at the right point in the image, so in the frame. How often do you use hyperfocal distance calculations for landscapes? Um, well, and I don't tend to use the calculations that often, but there is a rough rule of thumb that you can employ, which is you remember the the, um, the graphic I showed you that you get a little bit more behind the, the point of focus than you do in front. It breaks down when you focus quite close, but with wider subjects, you know, like a landscape, generally you get about two thirds of the depth of field behind the point of focus and a one third in front, which means if you focus about one third into the frame, then you're getting the, the right depth of field. But again, it, it depends. Um, it, it depends what I'm doing, to be very honest. Uh, if, for example, I was, I was recently testing um, some wide angle lenses and I checked and actually with some of those you only needed to close down to f8 and focus about a meter away and everything from um, sort of I don't know about 60 centimeters or something like that to infinity was sharp so it really depends on what you're photographing um, so I don't tend to use them that much but if I was a professional landscape photographer I would probably have started to use them initially and then tend what tends to happen is people just know right with this lens I know I need to focus x meters away and then everything's fine are there any standard settings for shutter speed etc when trying um, ICM um, intentional camera movement um, I'm just trying to think we have got a webinar all about intentional camera movement if you look up uh, Charlotte Bellamy's uh, webinar it's all about intentional camera movement I think when you first start it the um, inclination is to go for a long exposure like a second but um, that uh, you soon find out actually you probably only need something like uh, a fifteenth of a second because if you imagine it depends how much movement you want to make but often you don't need massive movement you just want quite subtle movement so you know we've seen a lot of ICM of uh, in bluebell woods and people are just sort of panning up or down and that actually doesn't take that long and if you have a whole second to do it you've got to move quite steadily and um, that kind of introduces bars or sort of juddery marks in, in your image so I would try 
a 15th or um, an eighth or a quarter of a second, something like that. And then just look and think, am I getting the blur I want? If it's not blurred enough, then set a slightly longer exposure. And if it's too blurred, then knock it back a bit. OK, so that's the end of the questions. I hope um, I hope that makes sense. I hope it helped pull it together. As ever, you know, if you've got any questions, please um, you know, feel free to go on Facebook and ask them because exposure is a key part of photography. It is photography, in fact, and it's really important to understand it. But nobody was born understanding it. Everybody is confused when they first hear it. You know, apertures are weird numbers. Shutter speeds, oh God, that's fractions. And ISO is some sort of abstract concept that, uh, and you know, some scientists came up with. So it isn't, you know, automatic, but it does sink in and eventually it does make perfect sense. And you'll find that you can take control and you do understand what you're doing. So persevere um, and give it a go. Okay, bye-bye then.